I like being able to make other people smile. I, I like accomplishing things and learning different things and doing different things. It was a typical day. Got up that morning, she was heading off to the Sheriff's Department for an internship. A little bit before 12, she left early. 30 minutes or so. Motor vehicle accident. And there's a car pull up in the driveway. With injuries. Sheriff's Department pulls up. Subject was ejected. I felt something was wrong, but it was like I wasn't putting too much into it. She is unconscious. It was just like maybe she didn't show up for work yet, or she's stuck somewhere. A gold minivan into the ditch. Initial dispatch, overturn, ejection, and they came back later and told us unconscious, barely breathing. Flight be back one, eight minute ETA on liftoff. He just said she was in a bad car accident. Looks like she was thrown from a vehicle approximately about 75 feet or so. They said it didn't look real good. We went to work. We needed to head down to MCV as soon as possible. The subject is out and breathing on the ground. However, it's not responding to them. A lot of life threatening injuries. The helicopter will be able to land right here at the scene. As we were providing patient care, uh, we just hear the helicopter circling on the land. Everything was done right there in the field where she landed. Light is back on the ground. It was obvious injuries throughout her entire body. It looked like a very grim sight. We couldn't get a blood pressure on her, so we were pushing a lot of IV fluids on her to try to stabilize her. We were having a really hard time uh, getting those breaths in that she needed, uh, so we ended up having to put a needle in her chest. Black back in there. We were having trouble feeling pulses. We were unable to get a blood pressure all the way through the entire transport until right at arrival at the hospital. When MedFlight arrived with Candy, we could tell that she was very sick. She had a lot of injuries. She had an obvious pelvic injury and a, a lower extremity deformity, suggesting that she may have significant internal bleeding and significant intra-abdominal injuries. We knew that she needed a lot of blood very quickly. We ended up having to put in a central line in her groin. This allowed us to use our rapid transfuser. We gave her several units of blood, several liters of fluid. Her blood pressure was continuing to drop despite all of the fluid and blood we gave her. We decided we need to go to the operating room emergently. In the operating room, our primary goal was to control the bleeding, and she had a significant amount of blood in her abdomen. We also noted that she had um, injuries to her intestines. The first thing we did was pack off her belly with pads to help control the bleeding and help stop the bleeding. But some of the bleeding was so deep that we couldn't get to it surgically. So we arranged for her to go to interventional radiology, where the radiologist can go up to the groin into the vessels and actually stop the bleeding from within. We had an anesthesia machine, and we had the anesthesia providers helping us keep her alive during the interventional radiology portion. So what we do is we try and control the things that may actually cause her demise first. I felt like I needed to be here and I didn't want to give up. We have a real big family of friends and we had the waiting room full of just our people. The hard part for Candy was only starting when she got out of the operating room because it was at this point that all of her other body systems started to shut down. Her blood wasn't clotting, her kidneys stopped working, and we still had to give her a lot more blood. A little over two times her blood volume was replaced just in the initial seven hours. And it continued throughout the night and, and into the next day. She was about as sick as a person could get. She was on uh, full ventilator settings, in fact, very aggressive ventilator settings. Uh, she, she was on uh, pressors to maintain her blood pressure. I signed up to be her primary then. Um, I actually didn't think she was going to make it. <clears throat> her injury to her left hemipelvis and left leg were um, extraordinary. What could be considered a, an internal amputation, uh, so, so severe was the, the trauma to her leg. You almost don't even remember all of the injuries, there were so many, because you're just trying to keep her alive. I remember talking to her husband, Reggie, and I remember having to tell him that she may not make it through this, and that the next 24 to 48 hours would be very critical. She has a strong will, so when he told me that she wasn't going to that, that it was up to her to pull through it. I said, if anybody could do it, she could. 
I remember we had uh, took her family back into the waiting room and had the conversation about, you know, you know, we didn't think this was going to be a good outcome. And, you know, we talked about being a DNR and I could tell the family just didn't think that was going to happen. We were kind of expecting uh, the worst and hoping for the best. We would talk about uh, how surprised we were that even in the first couple of days that she made it through the night before. The first, like, two weeks, it was touch and go. Initially, we had to put her on continuous dialysis, which is basically a machine which has been cleaning her blood 24 hours a day. Uh, because she was in shock and she was too unstable to tolerate intermittent dialysis. She returned from one of her many surgeries and um, she had developed this hematoma that eventually ended up into a massive wound on her leg through her groin area and she was so sick and at that point we were supporting every system you can think of. She did code a lot and she was brought back uh, sometimes with chest compressions and other times with drugs. Atropine is a medication we use to speed up your heart if it's too slow, so we had just planted it around the room and I saw her start to go down and I just gave her the atropine, so I was able to keep that from happening after that. Dr. Domson uh, in our department ended up helping some of the, the plastic surgeons with s some of the debridements where we debrided some of the, uh, the bone that had, had died around her iliac crest. We were consulted for a wound that needed a closure. When we walked into the room that day and they pulled the blankets back, we actually saw what was probably the largest hip wound I've ever seen. You could actually see her pelvic bone in the wound. It took out a whole chunk of her side. I mean, just. The, we didn't think even she was going to be able to keep that leg. We explained it to them that it might come a time when it was absolutely necessary that that leg would come, need to come off. In other words, that leg would be the thing holding her back and making her sick. However, the family was very adamant that we save the leg. So we had to come up with a different way to reconstruct this wound. Ultimately, we decided that her wounds were of a nature that, that a back would actually help heal her quicker than any other process. It involved multiple debridements of the wound, a very aggressive wound care and wound vacuum therapy to be able to regranulate tissue so that we could skin graft over that area. I was more concerned how Reggie and Maria were. I didn't really focus on my injuries at all at first. The team going into the room every day and updating the family and very honest about what they thought was happening and what the prognosis would be. And of course, day to day that changes, and so it's a difficult um, realm to surf through. Everything they was doing, they let me know. They, shoot, they did everything they could for me while I was there. I called them so many times at night uh, during the day. It was, uh, we kept pretty good contact with them. Her family was awesome. She had um, a husband and a daughter. The daughter came in a couple of times. Smartest little girl. I mean, she was six years old, but she was really cool about everything that was happening. You know, she'd draw pictures and send them in. They were very hopeful all along that we were gonna be able to save the leg, and they kept asking us to be able to do that, and we kept our promise with them and were able to do that. Uh, we were all impressed with the, uh, with the forward motion that always kept going with her care. And, you know, it was a couple weeks later, she kind of turned the corner. I was there when she first opened her eyes up and she looked at me and she looked around because she was trying to figure out where she was at. Because at the time she couldn't talk because she had a breathing tube in. So she looked at me and she calmed down. I think probably glad because I was there to calm her down. It was very hard for her as she woke up and learned what was going on. Um, this was going to be a long process for her. And I remember a time standing there where she had these tears in her eyes and she too didn't think she was going to make it. And I kept saying to her, Candy, you've come this far. Keep fighting. You can do this. She was always a trooper, especially the more awake she got and the more interactive she got. She always um, 
took all that pain with a smile and was willing to have us help her out. She just started making urine and we knew that that's her sign. Uh, and once that happened, very quickly she was, she was off dialysis. And I remember her asking me very clearly, am I still a DNR? And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I've never had a patient actually ask me that before. And I was like, oh, well, you know what? You don't need to be anymore. Yep, that was a good day for her. Everybody was real emotional because she was in there for a while. <laughs> and this is all uh, new bone that's starting to form. She likely won't be able to put full weight on that leg uh, in the future. Uh, she's able to start using that leg um, for more balance, um, which, you know, again, given the complexity to this injury is, is a miracle. Once Candy was not requiring a lot of medical support and all of her major medical issues had stabilized, and this took about four months, she was able to go to the rehabilitation doctors where she could get the care to start building her strength again, start learning to care for herself again. Definitely she had a lot of weight bearing precautions and um, just a lot of limitations and on top of that a lot of fear of, of moving and pain. It can be a scary thing for a patient I think as they start to explore what's safe for them to do for themselves and I think in order to be able to do that, you need to have a lot of trust in the people that are working with you. She went from a, a place of being unsure to really feeling confident in what she needed and what she wanted. When she, when they, she finally came through, she set a goal for herself then. She wanted to be out the hospital before my daughter's birthday. I needed to just keep going you know I figured that I had a different purpose I mean God wouldn't have waken me up if he didn't want me to live there were so many times when we talked to the family and said I think we need to reevaluate the situation and to go from that to seeing somebody in a wheelchair um, going home is is why we do what we do she was in my hospital more than a month and she set up a birthday party <laughs> get everything straight, like she ain't miss a beat. One of the things she had going for her was just good family support. You know, she was not on her own, and she isn't on her own out there, and that makes a big difference. She knew that they were there and um, that they were supporting her, and she, um, I think she drew strength from that quite a bit. She gave me a Christmas card this past year, which had this beautiful picture of her, her daughter, her husband, and looking at her there, you couldn't have known what she had been through the last year. It really does touch at how happy she is and how happy she is to have come through all this and, uh, and come through this with such a positive attitude and just happy to have every day. And it really shows in her and it's really contagious. I'm just so happy she was able to go home, be with her family, you know, be with her daughter, that things you know, could, have, could have been so much different, but now things are gonna be great to have somebody come back and talk to you and be a productive person, go back to their families and take care of her little girl is, is what this place is all about. It's, yeah, big time second chance. Yeah, big time second chance. Yeah, second chance we ain't gonna waste. <laughs>